So this is uh, work with a bunch of my colleagues at Metro Mile. Um, I'll, I'll give you a warning, there's no videos of robot snakes, so unfortunately, but there will be deep learning, which may be equally exciting if you're into that thing. Um, so a bit of background about Metromal and usage-based insurance, just so we can frame the problem. Metromal is a startup insurance company centered around usage-based insurance, and the idea is that you have um, low mileage drivers, high mileage drivers, yet typically insurance premiums are set at a flat fee, so you, know, you pay, say, per year or per every six months. Um, plus, what's happening is that Low mileage drivers are subsidizing high mileage drivers. So if there's a way to sort of charge insurance proportionate to that risk, you're getting closer to fair insurance. So the way that Metro Mile does it is we have this device called Pulse. We shove it into this OBD2 port and has a GPS, some other sensors, and that's how we basically track your mileage. So the idea behind this paper, or the reason it came about, was that device costs money. Um, you have to deliver it to the customer. In an ideal situation, you just have this thing on your app, and you could have essential insurance via an app. So very um, early stages, but that's where this paper came from. Uh, like I said, so we want to have this thing in an app, and the reason, sorry, on a phone, and the phone is kind of a useful device because it has a whole bunch of sensors, if you're not aware. It has an accelerometer, uh, GPS, gyroscope, magnetometer, on top of some other things. And so with these sensors, it enables um, a whole bunch of smart driving apps. So like I said, usage-based insurance, smart driving is another one. Um, but before you can actually have these apps, you need to actually detect driving. So this whole paper is going to be about that. Can we detect driving um, by a phone? And then more concretely, we're going to use convolutional networks, one of the deep learning architectures. Uh, so I'm going to short circuit the, like, the paper and just tell you what we found. So if you get bored, at least like, remember these three things. Um, in activity classification, deep learning beats traditional machine learning techniques after about 500 hours of driving data. So this is the common thing. You need a lot of data. How much? Roughly 500 hours for deep learning to work. Uh, moreover, these convolutional nets can detect driving behavior. So you know, as opposed to when you're on a bus, on a train, walking, on a bike, that type of thing. Um, third thing, we implemented this on a phone and it took about a 8 megabytes of storage and a, the sort of test time or predict, prediction takes about 4 seconds. Okay, so let's talk about existing approaches. So there's obviously you know, wide literature. I didn't mention the exact papers here, they're in the um, actual paper, but you can kind of think of them as sort of standard machine learning. So, you know, feature generation and then a standard classifier. So here, standard classifier like trees, ensembles of trees, um, nearest neighbors, SVMs, and sort of simple feedfold networks. These features uh, largely are based on accelerometer time series. Um, and so what they're doing is typically you get like a sliding window across this time series. Um, taking some statistical moments for each of those windows. And you've also got some autoregressive coefficients, which um, sort of like, I guess, look back in time. So the key advantage, if you're not familiar with deep learning, is that you don't have to do um, this feature engineering. You can sort of feed in the raw sensor input. The algorithm will learn how to trans transform that uh, raw sensor data into something useful and then, you know, work out whether you're driving or not. Okay, so let's talk about the model. So again, we're doing supervised learning. Um, there's gonna be a variance of this model, but this, the centerpiece, I guess, is a convolutional network where the input will be spectrograms. So spectrograms will just be, I guess, a pre-processing pre step to 
the raw sensor data, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second, but the two um, experiments we do is one is activity classification, so separating uh, still walking and automo moto automotive classes. So this task is really just to make sure that um, this classifier, this convolutional network actually makes sense. Uh, the second piece of this paper is then doing the driving detection. So given all this automotive um, you know, sensor data, so again, it could be on a bus, it could be driving, uh, it could be on a train, can we actually separate out the, um, you know, when you're driving? Um, I guess three distinct challenges, maybe, well, some of them unique to Metromile. So the first of these is it has to be energy efficient. So, you know, we're trying to put this on an app and we don't want the app to completely destroy the phone's battery. So I guess this is sort of separate than say, um, you know, you can imagine like Uber or Lyft, often drivers have the battery like charging continuously throughout the trip. Whereas if you're providing insurance, you kind of want to do it in a like, you know, low, low friction way. So battery is important. In that sense, we don't want to rely on the GPS, which is very battery intensive. Uh, the second of these is the sensor hardware differs across, across phones, so you don't have this single um, common unique measurement device. I mean, you have a phone, but the actual sensors differ across these devices, so you need to worry about that. Finally, um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, so when you, when you have sensor readings, they kind of, there's an X, Y, Z axis, so you think about an accelerometer. They're relative to your phone, not to some like, say, the Earth. So if you're driving like this, so you know an Uber driver is like sitting there with this in front of them, the axes pretty much always co correspond or are fixed throughout the trips. Whereas, you know, if you're an insurance, in theory insurance driver, like your phone could be anywhere. You could be like actually handling your phone, you'd be talking while you're driving, it could be in your you know, glove compartment. So you need to worry about these sort of axes or the sensor readings sort of coming in various sort of rotated um, orientations. Okay, so let's talk about the data. Um, so we have a random selection of roughly 2,000 drivers and we take uh, random two minute clips uh, from their phone. And so these are all Android smartphones, consumer grade smartphones. Um, in all we get about, for this paper at least, a bit over 5,000 hours of accelerometer and gyroscope readings. Um, a bit of pre-processing, we remove sleeping and at rest um, readings. Basically, they just look like still, like time series, so very easy to remove. Um, to account for these differences in hardware, we interpolate at 50 hertz accelerometer and 10 hertz for the gyro. Um, so you get these like regular, you know, aligned measurements. And finally, so you have this time series. We're going to split it up into 30 seconds with 50% overlap. So you can think of the raw data as going to, you know, from this point onwards being 30 seconds of sensor data. So for the accelerom accelerometer, it'll be the XYZ. Same thing with the gyroscope, XYZ. Um, like I said, two experiments, but maybe more detail. Activity classification is walk, still, or automotive. Um, because this is a, this experiment's largely a test for whether the Convenant does something sensible, we're just grabbing labels from the Android device itself. So if you've used like the um, Android sort of platform, there's a way to get activity labels from the device. We'll use those as labels. The second part of it, the driving detection, um, you know, driving or not, we actually have a, an iBeacon device which is uh, installed into the user's car and basically can tell whether the phone is you know, in close proximity to that iBeacon. So the idea is you know, we're going to these ran random samples, we're going to label them as driving when the person is actually in that vehicle. Um, the, let's quickly talk about the benchmark. So this is based on Heminki, um, again, standard, uh, you know, I guess traditional machine learning. 
So we're going to use a random forest uh, with these features. So let's quickly talk about them. Um, so statistical, like I said, just takes a moment over, say, sliding windows of the trip. There's time domain features, um, integral, zero crossing rate, and then finally, sum across the frequency domain. So this is sort of what you'd think is how to do um, activity classification if you did not have deep learning. Um, let's, okay, so the model. So like I said, convolutional network. So I guess the first question is why, well, let's talk about why, why deep learning in general. So the first of these is at Metromile, we get a lot of data. Um, and so deep learning, you, you can essentially just learn these features directly from the data. Um, that's common to, I guess, all, a lot of deep learning models, or most, if not all. And then second bit is why convolutional networks? Um, you know, you often hear about deep learning models having a lot of parameters. Convolutional networks are nice because it's in, in a, I guess, an effective way to reduce the parameter space. You're sort of sharing parameters across these filters. And the final thing you need for, really, for a convolutional network to sort of make sense is you need some sense of locality in the data. So you think about our data here, they're going to be spectro spectrograms. So you, you, I'll talk about in a second, you have time and frequency. So things closely connected in, say, the horizontal or time space kind of obviously relate to each other. The same thing could be said about the frequency space. So it sort of makes sense to use a convolutional network as opposed to you know, some straight feed forward network. Um, so the input is going to be, there's going to be various um, types of this convolutional network. So really these two dimensions you can think of in which they differ. The first is what is the input? Here we're going to use the spectrogram of the accelerometer and also the raw time series, so we'll compare how they matter. And then finally, this multi-stream, so we have different sensors, so you can kind of, you'll see a picture of this in a second, but basically merge two sensors. So merge, um, you know, accelerometer and gyroscope together to get some sort of classification. So let's, let's like, see these. You probably can't read that very well, but um, the first two, of these models are single stream convolutional networks. So the first of these is the accelerometer. So basically convert the accelerometer readings into a spectrogram, do some convolutional layers, um, some dense layers, and then softmax, which gets you uh, classification, well, the probabilities over those classes. Same thing, but where the input is raw time series. So don't convert the accelerometer readings into a spectrogram. And then the multi-stream. So the first of these is, you know, right at the top there uh, is the first one from the previous slide where you have accelerometer spectrogram basically into a soft, well, just before the soft max. Do the same thing for the gyroscope reading. So gyroscope is as spectrogram and then sort of merge at the end. And the final one of these is accelerometer, you know, to the pre-softmax layer. And then we also have these public transportation features, which are generated from GPS and um, you have GPS readings, you have the OSM database of the locations of various transportation uh, locations, so bus stops, train stations, train lines. Um, there's details on more, more on how we do this, but developing features that sort of would be useful for working out whether this GPS reading indicated whether you're close to a train, close to a public transport location or not. So we have those four architect, well, four models. Um, before showing you the results, let's quickly talk about spectrograms because they're sort of a key piece of um, the model. So what they are, uh, so you know, the sensor readings come as X, Y, Z over time. And so you can kind of convert that into the frequency domain by doing or running these FFTs on sliding windows of those sensors. So this is quite a common approach, but it's kind of useful to think what's going on here. So you end up with, if you, well, you can turn this into an image, but you end up with this picture here where along, 
the x-axis you have time and along the y-axis you have some frequency and the color represents the amplitude at that time at that frequency. So just converting raw sensor input into the frequency space. And so it turns out that the spectrograms a pretty nice like pre-processing step. So using these Android labels, we basically um, vectorize these spectrograms and then run this T-SNE algorithm, which is a nice way of representing sort of multi-dimensional data into 2D space. You can see it's pretty good at separating out um, the walking, so what do, what do we have here? Walking, still, and automotive classes. You, you may not be able to see this, but you can sort of see like, this sort of is a preview of where the difficulty will lie. You'll see that there's a bit of overlap between the blue and the green, which is indicative that it's going to be hard to sort of separate out um, still and automotive. And those little pictures are exact. Highly, well, good examples of um, those classes. You can see they look like the, the colors are very different across the three classes, which is indicative that it's a good separation or good pre-processing step to separate out um, the classes. So activity recognition results. So again, this is between walking, still, automotive. Um, you'll see the baseline is 0.84 AUC. The best of the deep learning models is the accelerometer and GPS. You get an AUC of 0.89, so much better, I'm sure. Um, again, classification matrix. If you look at this, the really only important thing you need to see is automotive and still. Um, so basically, on the right there are the two most confused or the greatest area of confusion. Okay, so how much data you, do you need before deep learning wins? So this is just using, I think, the accelerometer um, CNN. Uh, so on the left, the, that middle column is a baseline model. Um, here we're varying how much data we use. So we're increasing the amount of data. You'll see that the baseline model is better than say, deep learning at the start. Once you get to about 500 hours or you go over 500 hours, deep learning wins. So that's about the point where you want to sort of start relying on um, these convolutional networks. Uh, okay, so the, I guess the, maybe the most important part of the most important experiment. Let's talk about this driving detection task. So I didn't say this before, but, okay, I did say that about the, I talked about the eye beacon device. So driving labels again are basically determined by whether you're, you know, close to your car or not. So if you're in someone else's car, like we're gonna mislabel it, but that's where we're at. Um, it's also to mitigate that sort of problem, we restricted this these um, driving labels to users that had a single vehicle in their policy. So the idea was that they, you know probably didn't have two cars, so when they're in their car, sort of maximize the, ch the chances that they're actually in their own car, as in our labels were correct. Uh, a lot of vehicles in this data set, so 362 different vehicle types, so not different vehicles, like different models of vehicles. And so we didn't include that feature in our, um, in our model, so you can kind of think of further extension of this model, you sort of somehow incorporate uh, sort of, I guess, categorical variables of what type of cars these are. Uh, it turns out in our data set, I, I think that says Prius, Prius Civic, Corolla, Camry, are the f and then the Accord are the five most uh, popular, popular vehicle types in our data set. Um, and this, these are the results for the driving detection. So baseline, quite poor, 0.67 AUC, whereas our preferred Model, again, accelerometer and GPS, CNN, is 0.8. So again, this is a relatively small data set. Um, there's sort of, I, from what I can see, easy ways to improve the model, but even then, it does a lot better than, I guess, standard machine learning techniques. Okay, so the conclusion, in short, is this like sensor input to spectrogram to convolutional network is a very good way 
to do activity or driving classification if you have enough data. That's basically it. So, quick question on um, uh, crowdsourcing accelerometer data. Um, what we observed in the early years of, uh, of, of, of looking at that data was that uh, you could very quickly um, classify uh, people who break hard, people who break much more smoothly, and that's actually very nicely uh, um, tied to drivers. <coughs> the question is, in the context of uh, Metro Mile or in the broader context of insurance or pay-as-you-go, is there a further correlation that can be made whether it's uh, safe or not? Because in urban environments, you might be breaking a lot and much more aggressively just because you're a good driver because you're careful and people are much more aggressive. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're an unsafe driver. And so I was wondering if you have ever encountered a correlation like this or... Sure, so just to re rephrase, are you talking about whether we see an association with like heartbreaking events and then like risk of accident? Or exactly, because I mean, heartbreaking and, and tying it to specific driver identity or driver profile, that's pretty standard now. I mean, I think classification yeah. can be done, but then it doesn't necessarily mean that a heartbreaker is an unsafe driver. Yeah. It might be, might not be, I'm not, I don't know, and that's kind of the question. Yeah, I, don't, I, I know we, we do measure heartbreaking events. I'm not sure if we ever explicitly tied it to say like risk or pricing risk, just because, so I'm gonna say, I don't work at Metro Mall anymore, so this is like going off some you know, maybe outdated information. Uh, Metro Mile likes to see itself as sort of, um, I guess, a friend of the driver, and we're not going to sort of punish or discriminate on the basis of those events. So, I mean, it could be a real pilot. Yeah, it could, it, it could be, but I th we were kind of like, I guess, dissuaded from sort of associating machine learning stuff with like ri risk purely. So we, we didn't do it, although, you know, honestly, it would be very easy easy thing to do. You see accidents, you see behavior beforehand. Um, but yeah, I can't give you a definitive answer. Sorry, I mean, yeah. Great talk, thank you. Um, so in a conclusion, you are mentioning that you need a, the best results is with a spectrogram transformation, right? So I'm wondering with deep learning, the key idea there is we don't really want to do anything with the raw input. And so here, actually the best results is with kind of post-processing of that input. I'm wondering if, if you have a more deeper network, if you would get a reverse results where your know, deeper network would actually take care of yeah, that Yeah, that's spectrum. a good point. Um, like my, my way of thinking about why like spectrograms work is just having looked at this sensor data and like Android, like the messiness of these sensor readings com coming from Android. They're very noisy, some of them are very noisy. And so we have to do this like interpolation to get them to the same, like, you know, to make them comparable. But you're right, like if you had enough data, all of that kind of, um, you know, pre-processing or custom pre-processing -pre probably would not be necessary. Although I can see like the spectrogram, kind of you can think of it as sort of um, removing some of that excess noise and sort of like filtering out some of this, like, you know, the signal in that, in that sense of that. But it's, it's true. Like, I think we had like, what did I say? Like 5,000 5, hours, roughly a third of it is automotive. So it's not that much um, data. Like, I think we did this for about, we collected data for maybe like a month or two months. Whereas, you know, imagine if you Uber with more people, more customers, you know, larger time frame, you have humongous data. <laughs>